Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Engelbard Gaming! Today I'll be taking a look at every Data East game released on the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. So in this video I'm covering games that were either developed by Data East, published by Data East, or games that were published by other companies but were originally Data East games. I'll show you the arcade games next to the Genesis ports where appropriate. This leads us to a total of 13 games for this video. And no, I'm not including Sega or Mega CD titles in the list. Also, I'll be going through these games alphabetically. Alright, let's get on with it. Atomic Runner Chelnov was a pretty unique arcade action game that Data East released back in 1988. It's sort of like a cross between an endless runner and Contra. This title was also just known as Chelnov or Atomic Runner in some regions, and I'm going to stick with calling it Atomic Runner. Atomic Runner on the Genesis came out pretty well as you can see. In fact, visually, it's pretty clearly superior on the Genesis. The backgrounds are much more impressive than the arcade original, some of the weapons are less detailed and a bit smaller on Genesis, but everything else looks better. For those that don't know, and I guess those of you that do also, this game was kind of mired in controversy when it hit the arcades, since elements of the game's story were kind of based somewhat on the Chernobyl disaster that took place in 1986. Data East took a little heat for that, and changed a bunch of the game's story elements for when it was later released on the Genesis in 1992. I'd say this is one of the rare circumstances where the home version of the game is superior to the arcade original, and I think it's pretty easy to see why in this case. It's pretty cool that Data East kept the level layouts from the arcade game, and completely changed the style of several of the areas between the two versions. Most of the enemies have also been given a complete facelift for the Genesis port, some looking entirely different. These changes definitely keep both games worth playing, since they deliver a bit of a different experience. Atomic Runner is fun and kind of underrated, and it deserved more attention when it was new, and I definitely recommend giving this one a try. The controls aren't super intuitive, and you'll die a lot at first, but once you get used to it, you'll get into a groove. I might do a full, utterly pointless comparison episode on this one in the not-too-distant future. It'd be a real interesting episode with all the graphical differences between these two versions. Now here's another game that was slightly overlooked in its day because there were so many beat-em-ups out there, and Marvel wasn't exactly at a high point when it was released into the arcade in 1991. Yeah, Captain America and the Avengers was competing in a pretty crowded market in those days, but you know what? I like this one a lot. The arcade game is fun, has a lot of voiceovers, looks good with really colorful backgrounds, and has well-drawn sprites, and is still worth playing today for any beat-em-up fans, even though it's definitely not the best game in the genre. It's kind of unfair at times, but hey, that's the nature of these games in the arcade, right? A year later, Data East ported this game to the Genesis, and it's still really good. The graphics in particular have taken kind of a major hit especially the backgrounds, but the music is really great in this port. But we do have to talk about something in the Genesis version. What. The. F is going on with Vision and his hilarious walking animation in this version? Anyway, aside from the super weird Vision animation, this game cuts out those nice comic-like illustrations found in the opening from the arcade game, which is kind of a bummer. But again, that music is really good, and I think a lot of it even sounds better than the arcade original, despite the fact that the sound chip in the arcade game was clearly more advanced than the sound chip in the Genesis. Or sound chips, I should say. Overall, Captain America and the Avengers is still a fun game today on the Genesis, and definitely worth playing. In 1986, Data East released sort of a middling, vertically scrolling arcade shooter called Darwin 4078. Not content with releasing one mediocre vertical shooter, Data East followed Darwin 4078 up a year later with a sequel called Super Real Darwin. Not content with only boring arcade players with two mediocre, vertically scrolling shooters, Sega thought it'd be a good idea to take that Data East game and port it to the Mega Drive and release it as Darwin 4081, and here we are. There are a few interesting ideas in Darwin, I guess, but there's also loads of frustrating elements that just kind of hamper the experience and make it one that I'd say is A-OK -okay to miss out on. Visually, it's kind of bland and the music isn't great either. 
and the gameplay, well, uh, let's just say it's not so hot. Now, just as for the quality of the port itself, Sega did a good job with the material they had, and as you can see, it looks and plays pretty close to the arcade original, with a few minor changes to some stuff here and there. And I don't want to waste any more of your time with this. The port of Darwin 4081 to the Mega Drive from Super Real Darwin was well done, but still... The game is not fun. Alright, here's a weird one. Dashin' Desperados was an original game released by Data East for the Genesis in 1993. It's a two-player versus racing action platform game. What the hell is that? Well, you see, there are two characters, and player one either races against a CPU or human opponent. You both have to make your way through some pretty basic platforming areas while attacking each other and doing the occasional boss fight. Whoever wins gets a kiss from the girl at the end of the level. So if virtual kisses from super weirdly designed characters are your thing, then oh boy, Dashin! Uh, no, I can't say it. Get some help. This game is just kinda okay. There was a time in the past, my retro gaming friends, when a little character called Sonic the Hedgehog hit the scene, and his success, shall we say, inspired some copycat mascot platform games. Data East was a little late to the Sonic clone party, releasing High Seas Havoc in 1993. High Seas Havoc is a pretty decent attempt at the whole platforming mascot thing. The production values are great. The game looks and sounds like an upper-tier Genesis game from that era. There's no question about it. The control, however, isn't so great, and it's way too easy to just blindly run into enemies or obstacles, but at least you can take a few hits. I also found attacking enemies really sloppy in this game. So overall, I'd have to say, despite the a visuals and music, the gameplay in High Seas Havoc is kind of a letdown. Again, I appreciate the artistry, but I just didn't have much fun with this one. There are way too many cheap hits, and those sloppy attack mechanics just make it a chore to play. So is it a bad game? No, definitely not. Is it a great game? No, definitely not. If you love 16-bit platformers, you'll probably enjoy going through it at least once. Sonic fans in particular will probably enjoy the gameplay style, even though it doesn't really compare to the Sonic titles. But I'd say it's worth playing at least one time if you've never experienced it. Alright, here's another arcade port. Joe and Mac was released into the arcades by Data East in 1991. It was also ported to the SNES as an early title that same year. Strangely enough, the Genesis port of Joe and Mac here didn't see release until years later in 1994. So, how did it turn out? Yeah. As you can see here, it looks pretty good. The sound isn't too bad either. This port follows the arcade version a little more closely than the earlier SNES port, so fans of the arcade game may actually prefer this version to that one. Personally, I'm not a huge Joe and Mac fan on any platform. The weapons are kind of slow and the levels are super short. I know this series has its fans though, and if that's you and somehow you missed out on this late Genesis port, it's absolutely worth checking out. For everyone else, I mean, if you're into arcade action games and you missed out on Joe and Mac, I'd say give it a shot and see if it's for you. This is another one of those titles that isn't bad, but I just don't think this is top tier material. Here's a fun one. Mega Turrican is definitely the best game on this list. It was developed by Factor 5 and published by Data East in 1994. So, yeah, we have another very late Genesis game here. You may wonder why I'm not showing Amiga Turrican 3 next to this one. You see, after Turrican 2, Factor 5 began work on the sequel, Turrican 3. But by the time they'd started development, the Amiga market was starting to shrivel in Europe and consoles were well on their way to taking over. So Factor 5 scrapped what they were working on and targeted the Mega Drive for a newly redesigned game that will be called Mega Turrican. After they were in development of Mega Turrican for a while, it was decided that they'd port that game to the Amiga and call the Amiga version Turrican 3. The funny part of this story is that Factor 5 didn't publish games for consoles, so they needed to make a deal with an established publisher. What's so funny about that, you rightly ask? Well, even though the work on the Mega Drive game started long before the Amiga port, 
the Amiga version actually ended up being released first, as the completed Mega Drive game sat on the shelf awaiting a publisher. Anyway, enough of the history lesson. Mega Turrican is absolutely fantastic. It's not quite as good as Turrican 2, but it's a close second. Mega Turrican looks better than that game, has music that's nearly as good, and is a little more action-focused, with exploration being slightly de-emphasized in this game as compared to Turrican 2. The grappling hook element is a little rough and sloppy, but other than that, everything else in this game is absolutely excellent. And if you haven't played Mega Turrican yet, well, you should fix that as soon as possible. 1989 was a pretty good year for arcade games. We got stuff like Golden Axe, Final Fight, and to a lesser extent, Midnight Resistance. Never heard of Midnight Resistance? Well, imagine Contra, but with a rotary controller and power-ups only available between levels. Well, you know what? Don't imagine it, because you're looking at it right now. Also, this was Data East's follow-up to their overhead military shooter, Heavy Barrel. It's not really a sequel, but it does share a lot of elements from that game. Two years after the release of Midnight Resistance in the arcade, it was ported to the Genesis. This one was published in the US by Sega. And while the colors are inexplicably a lot darker than the arcade game on Genesis, and the Genesis port loses some music, the two-player simultaneous mode, and rotary controller, it's still a great port. I know it sounds like they took out a whole lot of stuff from what I just said, but really what's left is like 95% of what made the game good in the first place. What we get in the Genesis port is all of the arcade game's levels and power-ups, a choice of several different control schemes, at least one of which could work for pretty much any player, and music that actually sounds noticeably better than the arcade original, even though we lose one of the three level songs from the arcade game. I played Midnight Resistance a lot back when it was new, both in the arcade and on Genesis, and it's still worth playing today. It won't set your world on fire, but it's still a running gun that isn't quite in the same league as genre heavy hitters like Contra and Gunstar Heroes, but is still absolutely fun to experience. I did an utterly pointless comparison episode on this one early in the life of the channel that I'll link in the description and above. In 1995, with the popularity of the Genesis waning, Data East thought, Hey, you know what the answer to that is? A pool game! That should kickstart the old Jenny, right? Minnesota Fats fits into Data East's side pocket series of pool titles. And, uh, well, yeah, it's a pool game, all right. See? It's pool. Is it good? Yeah, that's kind of tough to say. <laughs> there are way better pool games that came out in later generations. But hey, at least they actually added 8-Ball into this one, unlike the earlier release of Side Pocket. Personally, I find it tough to play and enjoy 8- or 16-bit pool games these days, but if you're into these classic pool titles or have some nostalgia for them, maybe this will be for you. And, well, that's all I have to say about that. Ooh, here's one that kinda hurts. <laughs> Sega released Outrunners into the arcades on their System 32 multi-hardware in 1993. That board had hardware scaling and was pretty advanced for the time the game was released. As you can see, the arcade game is quite impressive. As you can also see, the Genesis port released a year later in 1994 is not. Sega published this game themselves for the Mega Drive in Japan, but didn't consider it worth bringing over to the US. Data East came along, got the publishing rights in the US, and then promptly proved Sega right. Outrunners on the Genesis is so-so at best. While Sega's port of the original Outrun on the Genesis was pretty good, considering the hardware limitations, Outrunners was just way out of the Genesis' league from a technical standpoint. What we got on the Genesis version of Outrunners was a bland split-screen racer with dramatically less detail than the arcade original, and it doesn't even look as good as the port of the original Outrun that came out before it. But how does it play, you may wonder? And the answer is, eh, not so great. It's not terrible, but it's just, I mean, it's, it's middling. It's middling. It's not very good. And yeah, you can play it two players, but there were way better racing games on the Genesis by the time Outrunners was released for the system. Like, you know, the original port of Outrun that came out years earlier. Outrunners is one of those games that you really only ever want to play, so you can fire it up and be shocked at what a bad port of the arcade game it is. This one wasn't worth playing when it was new, and it isn't worth playing now, either. Oh hey, it's another pool game. Here's Side Pocket, 
This one is older than Minnesota Fats. It's serviceable, I guess. So we've got an arcade game to go with it this time around as well, and as you can see, the Genesis version, for the most part, looks a little nicer than the arcade game. Still, Side Pocket is understandably less advanced than Minnesota Fats, and has fewer game modes. For example, it doesn't include 8-Ball because why would you throw in what's probably the most popular pool game? Anywho, as you can see here, there were some interface changes in this game's trip to the Genesis, and overall the Sega port is a little nicer, despite missing the player animations present in the arcade game. If old-school 2D pool is your thing, you might still like either this game or Minnesota Fats. It's definitely not my thing, though, so I'd say while this is not a bad game, it's not really worth playing today. You know what arcade game from the mid-80s had a great reputation back in its day despite the fact that it totally sucked? Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja. Bad Dudes was a pretty big hit for Data East. Big enough that they decided to make a follow-up years later, even though it's not a direct sequel. Crude Buster, released in Japan in 1990, is clearly an upgraded follow-up to Bad Dudes and is a better game than that one. But still isn't exactly what I'd call... Oh, what's the word? Uh, good. The game was released in US arcades under the name 2 Crude. That's 2 spelled T-W-O because there's two players. Get it? Get it? <sighs> in 1992, Data East decided, hey, let's throw this mediocre side-scrolling beat-em-up onto the Genesis. And that's just what those crazy cats did. Except they lengthened the name to two crude dudes in the US for some reason. As a port of the arcade game, it retains all the levels and most of the gameplay elements, but the visuals take a noticeable hit. If you check out the backgrounds, they're quite a bit less detailed than the arcade original. There are also fewer items to pick up and use as weapons in the Genesis port. When it comes to gameplay, I mean... The port is pretty fine, I suppose. It captures most of the arcade's gameplay elements. So it mostly plays like that one, but is definitely missing a few things from it, while also adding a few very small minor things. Is Two Crew Dudes worth playing today? Eh, you might find it worth it for a laugh or two, but this is one of the weaker Data East action games on the system. It's kind of slow and frustrating, there are lots of cheap hits, and I find the whole visual aesthetic pretty off-putting personally. I don't hate it or anything, but I've only bothered playing it a few times in my life, and, well, I'm just fine with that. Here's the final game in our list today, Vapor Trail. This hit the arcades in 1989, courtesy of Data East, and, well, I'm not a huge fan of either the arcade original or the Genesis port. It's alright, and definitely better than Data East's earlier stuff like Super Real Darwin, but I don't like the power-ups in this game, the levels are kinda bland, and it just doesn't really do anything to distinguish itself among its peers. Still, it looks nice, and the music is pretty impressive, especially in the arcade version. Vapor Trail was released on the Genesis two years later in 1991, published by Renovation in the US. And it's an okay port when all is said and done, but the visuals and music definitely take a bit of a hit on Sega's 16-bit console. Some of the gaming magazines hyped this game like crazy back in the early 90s, but in the end, this is just nowhere near the top tier of vertically scrolling shooters, or shmups, on the system. For example, I'd take Musha over Vapor Trail any day of the week. Like a lot of the games on this list, Vapor Trail is decent. It's definitely not a bad game. But this game is on a system that had loads of competition in the same genre, including a bunch of similar games that are just better than this one. If you're a fan of overhead shooters, you'll probably enjoy making your way through Vapor Trail at least once or twice. But I don't see many people coming back to this one over and over. Since a classic, it is not. Okay, so that's a look at every Data East game on the Genesis. There's some evidence that Data East helped Sega with the Genesis port of Virtual Fighter 2, but since they weren't the sole developer or publisher of that title, I didn't include it in this list. When all is said and done, there are a few really good games in this list, some average ones and a few definite misses. While I don't think anyone will be missing out by skipping on the pool titles, games like Midnight Resistance, Captain America and the Avengers, Atomic Runner, and Mega Turrican are all well-made games that hold up fine today. You may even be able to extract a little fun out of things like High Seas Havoc, Dash and Desperados, Vapor Trail, and even two crude dudes if you're in the mood.
Data East wasn't really a top-tier publisher when it came to Genesis games, but they did give us a few gems either directly or indirectly. Personally, I feel a look at their library on the system was well worth it. So what about you? What's your favorite Data East title on the Genesis? Which ones do you hate? Tell me about them in the comments! And that'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed the video, please toss it a like and share it online somewhere. If you haven't yet, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any videos. If you're so inclined, you can now support me and the work I do here either on Patreon or Ko-fi. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.